All right, let's start. Good afternoon, everyone. So ECMAScript 2015, my favorite parts. So this is going to be a showcase of my favorite features from ECMAScript 2015. So if you guys have your laptops with you, I would recommend you to go to my website. That's andredwart.info. And over there, you can find the slides that I'm going to present. And inside of the slides, Every time that code will appear, and as you can imagine, there will be a massive amount of code, you will find a link saying try me. And if you click over there, you will be redirected to a JS bin that has the code that I'm presenting, so you can play with it as I'm presenting it. So it's a little bit less boring. So first, a little bit about myself. My name is André Duarte. I am currently a front-end developer for Vlip. That's the Portuguese house for Paddy Power Betfair. And for the past few years, I've been mostly building the Betfair Sportsbook mobile web application. And this is a, uh, this is a, a really big application. It's like over 100,000 lines of code. And it's fully written in JavaScript, both the front end and the back end. And I'm actually proud to say that, uh, uh, that uh, quite a big part of it is already it, uh, written using ECMAScript 6. So let's start a little bit by uh, telling the history of ECMAScript. So ECMAScript started by, um, and, 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 it's, and the first three major versions were actually um, an intent to solve the mess that was created between what was Netscape's implementation of JavaScript and Microsoft's clone that was called JScript. So after those three implementations, finally on ES3 we have a stable implementation. So the guys at ECMAScript started to think a little bit ahead and trying to evolve the language. So they were trying uh, to come up with ES4. That, was, that would be the fourth iteration of the language that would, was going to have a lot of things, like the, it was going to have modules, classes. But 10 years later, they couldn't reach a consensus. So eventually, it was abandoned in favor of a much smaller iteration called ES5 that was released in 2009. Now, fast forward to 2015, and we got back some of the proposals from ES4 into what's called ECMAScript 2015. People actually call it ECMAScript 6, and I will refer to it as ES6 because it's easier, but the actual name is ES2015 because it was released in 2015, and from now on, we are supposed to have yearly iterations on the language instead of waiting another 10 years. So, in terms of compatibility, browsers are actually doing quite well. So most of the major browsers almost have full compatibility with ES6. But we still have a couple of problems. One of them is Safari. So Safari is still laying a little bit behind in terms of implementation of ES6. And then you have the problem of the users that are stuck in IE11. So the guys that have IE11 and that don't have automatic updates, they won't really get um, to, to, to evolve to the Edge browser, also Microsoft. And, and so for the, uh, because of these two, I would recommend you to use something called a transpiler. And B B Babel is probably the, mo the, 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 the most famous transpiler of ECMAScript 6. And what a transpiler will do will, uh, is basically convert your ECMAScript 6 code back to a a ECMAScript 5 so as to give compatibility to those browsers. But, uh, well, as Lina Serval says, talk is cheap, so let's see some code. Let me start by the let keyword. So, if you guys, if you guys like JavaScript, you've probably read JavaScript, the good parts by D Douglas Crockford, right? Well, in, the, in his book, D uh, Douglas Crockford classifies the, the variables in JavaScript as one of the awful parts in, of JavaScript. And why is that? Well, the main reason is that variables in, in JavaScript do not have block scope. Instead, they will have what is called function scope. And so th weird things will happen. So for example, if you define a variable inside of an if block, you can still access it out out outside of that if block, which is not very usual in programming languages. And then because of this thing called hoisting, you can actually access variables before they are defined, which also doesn't make any sense. So my first recommendation to you would be to start using ECMAScript 6 by never using the var keyword ever again. 
Actually, if you use JS lint or some other linter in your code, you can safely replace all of, the, all, all of your vars with let's. Because let will have block scope. And because it has block scope, if you declare a, a variable inside of an if clause, it will not be available outside of that if clause. And then another thing, you don't have um, you don't have to declare all of your variables on top of the functions because, because with the let, even, um, even if you try to make a reference to a, to a variable that is in that function, it will throw an error and it will not let you do that. But there is a case where you shouldn't use let but should use another keyword that's called const. So basically, when you are defining constants in JavaScript, if you're using a var or a let, uh, you're pretty much entering a dangerous zone because nothing is guaranteeing you that some other piece of code that is accessing that variable, it will not decide and change the value of pi, for example. So if you want that not to happen, you should use co the const keyword. Because if you use the const keyword and somebody tries to modify that value, you will you may immediately get a read-only exception. But please bear in mind that the constant is, diff is a different thing than an immutable. So imagine that you, are, you want to create an, a configuration object and you want it to be a constant. You may declare it as a constant, but that doesn't mean that you cannot change that object. You cannot swap that object into another one, but you can't really um, freeze the, the content of the object. If you want to do that, you must still call object.freeze, and that way, the object will be an immutable now, kind of an immutable, let's say. Now, let's start talking about functions. So, functions in JavaScript allow you to define, basically, like an example that we see here, you can define a function with three parameters, but then only call it with two parameters. So that's why many times you, what you actually want is default values on your, on your functions. And so in JavaScript, if you want a default value, you pretty much can't get away from an ugly piece of code like that. You need to use a, a ternary operator to assign variables if they are, and to assign values to variables if they enter as undefined. Now that piece of code is not really beautiful, isn't it? Uh, and ECMAScript 6 now brings you the solution. So if you now want to declare default parameters, you can do it directly on the function declaration, making it much, much more readable and with much less uh, dirty code, let's call it. The rest parameter is also a very nice addiction. So imagine that you have a function that takes two parameters. There is, there is the possibility of calling that function with more than those two parameters. So for example, here I'm calling it with five parameters. But if inside the function I want to have access to those three extra parameters, the thing I'm going to do is this, which takes a little bit of code gymnastics because you have the array, the array the, you have the arguments array, but then the arguments array is not really an array, so it's, it's kind of a mess to actually make a slice out of it and just take the extra parameters. Once again, ES6 simplifies this because now you can declare the last variable with, that, with that, that three dots notation to be the rest of the parameters that are being evoked on that function. And that will come as an array. Now, another really interesting feature, this, this is one of my favorites, um, is called the template literals. So a template literal is pretty much a basic string. Now, the only difference is in that instead of defining it with, um, with quotation marks, you define it with a grave accent. And out of the box, you, get, Im you immediately get this behavior, which is really cool, is that you don't have to escape anything but the, um, the grave accent itself, that you don't really use that much just alone, not applied to a letter. And that uh, allows you to do, for example, multi-line strings. But the most interesting feature about template literals is actually string manipulation. So imagine here, I have, I have two variables. I have one that's called event. I, want, I have one that's called today and contains the, the, the today's date. And then I want to, to build a string that's, that, that is basically using those two variables. What I have to do is to manually concatenate every piece of that string and I, I, I even have to consider the white spaces in the middle. Now with template literals, it's really cool to do string manipulation because basically 
w w uh, the template literals allow you to evoke the dollar sign and a couple of brackets, and whatever you put inside that, those brackets will be JavaScript evaluated. So, as that code is parsed, it, uh, the, 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 the string, that the, the, the code that is inside of those brackets will be evaluated as JavaScript and directly outputted to the function, which is really cool and makes, especially, uh, it's not really a case of much less code. Yes, it has less code, but it's more a thing of being more readable because now I look at that string and I can immediately understand what it's doing there. Now, let's talk a little bit about objects. So, the n in JavaScript, we are always declaring objects, and we're using the object literal notation, which is basically declaring an object with the two brackets. Now, a very, a very typical scenario is that I have a collection of variables, and then I want to build an object out of those. Now, in JavaScript, you usually have, well, let's take this for example. So you have some constant, you have name and surname. If I want to create an object out of that, I need to say, I want this object to have some constant that corresponds to some constant, name that corresponds to name, surname to surname, etc. Now, with the, new note, with the new object literal, you don't have to do all that repetition. Basically, if you want to create an object that contains some constant and name, you will just open the brackets and just say some constant and name. And the JavaScript will know that you are actually meaning you want some constant to have the value of some constant. Oh, and actually, even on functions, you, you, can, always, you can also forget about uh, writing the function keyword because, you know, if you have a couple of parentheses and a couple of brackets, it's pretty much a function. So you, don't, you just don't have to write the function keyword anymore. Now, object destructuring is a bit of the opposite scenario. So imagine that you have an object, that you receive some object from some service, for example, and you want to, to deconstruct it into its properties. And you want to put those properties to variables. So this is, the, this is a very typical scenario. So in here, since I want title and duration, I have to say let title be presentation.title, let duration be presentation.duration. But using the object destructuring assignment, I can do this in a much easier way. So I can basically say, give me the variable title and duration from presentation. So it's a much easier, much, re much more readable syntax. Actually, if you want, you can even change the name of those variables into variables that you prefer. Now, let's take what we've learned so far and try to refactor this piece of code. So in here, we have a function that's called tweet this, and it looks like it receives a message and some optional configs. And then by looking at the code, I can see that that optional configs looks like an object, and that object receives a property that's called when and a property that's called share to Facebook. And they both have default values. So the first thing I can do here is use the destructuring assignment. And by using the destructuring, assi the, the destructuring assignment, I can now very easily say this function takes a message and an object that contains when and share to Facebook. So right now what I did was move code to the place that it supposedly belongs, which is to the first line of the function declaration. But I can do even better because I'm still, I'm still declaring the default values of those properties. So I can also move them to the top. I can now say I have this, this function that takes a message and takes an optional parameter of when and share to Facebook and their respective default values. Now what I did here was what ES6 is all about. ES6 is not really about new features. It's, it's more about a better way to, to write your code, which will translate in a better way that you can also read your code. Because if you compare the last line with the first one, you can see that in the, in the last line you have less characters, more information, and more readable. So now let's talk a little bit about the, probably the most popular ECMAScript 6 feature, the arrow functions. So an arrow function is pretty much like a normal function. The only thing is that you can basically omit the, 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 function, the, the, the function keyword, and instead of that, you have to put this thing that is called the fat arrow, which is equal and um, bigger than sign of. And actually, if these functions are so small that they can just take one line, you can, get, you can even get rid of the brackets and the return statement and do it just in one line, like a lambda function. 
Now, the thing is, all of these three functions do exactly the same, and they work exactly the same. But if you take a look at those three different flavors of a function, personally, but this is only my, person, my personal opinion, it's not really a thing of the standard, I look at the first one, and I can immediately see what it's doing. So it's a function, circle area, and it returns r, uh, pi times r times r. Now, if I look at the second and last, uh, uh, the second and third versions, I tend to find it more difficult to understand the code that is in there. So I, I personally, I don't think that this is the best use case for arrow functions. But let's take this example. If I have an array, and this array contains some strings inside of, a, uh, inside of it, and I'm then assigning a count, which is basically an array based on the sizes of the strings that are inside of that array. So what I do is call array.map and, and pass it a mapping function. So it's pretty easy, right? But with an, with an arrow function, here is the case where an arrow function really makes things easier to read. So if you can see, the last line of code is very clear about what it's doing. So I'm basically mapping an array which is basically, uh, sorry, I'm running on an array, a map, that is mapping the input dot length. It's very, very easy to, um, to, to read that way. But probably the biggest feature and probably the biggest reason people are starting to use arrow functions everywhere is, um, is this example here. So take a, take a look at this code. So this is a very traditional piece of code. This is the classic module pattern where I am assigning some properties to the, to the module and I also have a function that basically has access to the properties and it goes and it iterates through the words and creates a sentence by concatenating it. So there's nothing wrong with that piece of code, right? It will work, it works pretty well and you usually do this every day. But still, it smells really bad because of that thing that I hate called self equals this. So if you notice inside of the for each, even though I am trying to access this dot sentence, I am calling it self dot sentence. And why is that? That's because when I, when I pass a function as a callback, JavaScript will just stop knowing what this is. And this can be really frustrating, especially when you start learning this language. And I remember, like about 10 years ago when I started learning JavaScript, I, I have no idea why this happened, why sometimes I could use the this and sometimes I couldn't. So the technique that I found that is very usual was to, at the beginning of the module, just declare self equals this, because then, uh, the self will just fall through, uh, through the scope inheritance and you can access self in there, which is supposed to mean the same as this, but this one actually works. Now, ECMAScript 5 offers you a solution which is called function.bind, but I really believe that that one is even smellier because it's, again, not understandable. And arrow functions can re really help you with that because arrow functions exist to be mostly passed as callbacks. So it makes all the sense in the world that in this case, the, the, the arrow function doesn't have its own this context. It will inherit the context from whoever is calling it. So in this case, the outer scope. And by using arrow functions on your callbacks, you basically can get rid of a lot of code smell from your code base, which is really, really cool. And this is probably the biggest reason why people are using arrow functions everywhere nowadays. So now for something completely different, let's talk about classes. Is it possible to create a class in JavaScript? Yes, it is. Is it, is it difficult? It's not that much. So you first start by declaring uh, a constructor. So if you want a class that's named person, you will declare a constructor named person. Then if you want to add methods to that, to that class, you basically define the methods inside of the constructor's prototype. Now, should you want to write a static method, now instead of assigning it to the prototype of the constructor, you assign it directly on the constructor. 
So yeah, it's not that difficult. But the thing is, it, can, it could be a lot easier. So in ES6, we can, if we, if, we, if we want to create a class that's named person, we will ex write exactly that. So I want a class that's named person. And then if I want a constructor, I will just build a constructor and call it constructor. And if I want a method, I will just create the method inside of the class as it should. And if I want a static method, basically, I will only prepend static to the method name. So these, code, the, the, these two pieces of code are exactly the same. They translate to exactly the same when converted to ECMAScript 5, but this one is much more readable, isn't it? And now for something almost ridiculous. Let's try to implement uh, class inheritance in JavaScript. Is it possible? Yes, it is. Is it difficult? Let's see. So you start by having here a class named person, and basically I want to create this class that's named student that extends from person. So the first thing I got to do is I must call the person, the person constructor with the context of the student. So I will do person call and pass it this. Then this will give me the properties, but not the methods. So because I want the methods, I will have to do student.prototype equals an instance of the per person prototype. And this instance is special because it needs to be created with object.create and not the new keyword. Now as I do this, and this is the ridiculous part, now as I do this, I am basically replacing the student prototype with the person prototype. So what happened is that I just lost my student prototype constructor. So I need to reassign the, the, the student constructor to the student prototype constructor. And only now I can start adding methods to my class that inherits from person. So is it, is it doable? Yes. But fortunately, I was fortunate enough to have an internet connection I was, as I was doing this presentation because I have implemented sometimes uh, class inheritance in JavaScript and even having some experience, I, I keep forgetting the syntax because it's just very complex to the point that it's almost impossible to do without following some instructions. Now, ECMAScript 6 does this very, very easily. So you have a class named person, right? And you want to extend it. Uh, sorry, you have a class named person and you want to create a class named student that extends from person. Now, if you want to do that, that's exactly what you write. You write class student extends person. Couldn't be, si could, couldn't be more, more simple than that. Now, if you want a constructor, you'll put the constructor in there and you have access to this special property called the super that refers to the parent class. So you basically just call super with the, with the, with the properties of the parent. Now, if you want methods, you just add the methods and don't think about that anymore. And if you happen to override some, uh, to, um, to call the, the parent methods, you could just evoke super again. So this is one of those cases that I think that the code speaks for itself. In ECMAScript 5, if we wanted to do this, the code complexity reaches a level that is almost ridiculous. And in ES6, it's just much easier to do. But once again, this is exactly the same feature. The, the same feature. That code translates into that one. Now, let's talk about my favorite part. And this is definitely my favorite part of the ECMAScript 6 standard. So it's called modular programming. So when you do a JavaScript-based application, you don't want to do everything in the same file, right? Because that, that would be just that, that would be just chaotic, and uh, I don't think it can be done. And even in a small application, I think you should try to divide it in files. And so take, let's take a look at this example over here. So I am dividing this very small application into three files. One of, one of, one of it is constants.js that has some constants. The other one is services.js that uh, has a basically some wrappers for an API. And then I have core.js that basically is executing some actions. Now, if you take a look, there are cross-references between these three files. So basically, services is using some constants, and the core.js is using some services. It's calling those services. Now, the thing is, 
you can put these three files in the browser and it will work, but it will work based on one thing that's not really a good sign, which is sharing the global context of JavaScript, which in the browser is usually called window. And that's not really good, right? And you could try not to pollute the scope of the window by, by basically bundling all of your code together into one file, put an Im immediately invoked function around it, and there you have it. You're not polluting the scope anymore, the, 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 the global scope anymore. But you know what? You keep having those dependencies. So what happens here is that since I am over there using a constant that was declared on top, if I happen to create this bundle by changing the order of any of those files, the code just won't work. And I think that many people have already come into scenarios like this that your code is not working because basically you're consuming the files in the, in the wrong order. And this happens because you're creating a chain of dependencies. And that is not a bad thing per se, but the thing here that is really bad is that this chain of dependencies translates into no code at all. So you don't have any code inside here that is telling you that services is depending from constants or that CoinJS is depending from services. So let's use ECMAScript 6 modular programming to solve this issue. So first, in the constants.js, instead of just defining the constants, I will now export those constants. It's as easy as that. And by exporting those constants, I can now, inside of the services.js file, say, import me those two constants that I need from the constants file. So as easy as that. But also, that services file doesn't really have any action, right? It's just defining some functions. So I must not forget to export those functions so other people can also include that module and use them. And now on CoreJS, it's pretty easy. So I just import the variable that I'm using from constants, and I will import the, the whole API from services, and then just call API dot the name of the function. Now, here we solve two problems. One of them is organization. So now you look at the code and you immediately know its dependencies. So if I want to change a constant, I don't need to blindly be looking for the constants file. I have the name right there. But the second one, and probably the most important one, is that you, you don't have to do the bundles in the same kind of dumb way that you do them nowadays. So basically, if you want to send your application into production, you, you usually still do a bundle of, of all the files into one. But the thing is, usually you get your task runner to get you like a folder of, uh, of, of JavaScript files and then concat them all together, but please remember to put uh, AngularJS and jQuery first, for example, so the code works. Now, by declaring this, by declaring the imports, I don't have to think about that anymore because I basically just need to bundle this core.js because the core.js has its dependencies and its dependencies just register other dependencies. So the bundler will automatically know the chain of dependencies and that will translate into the, the order of how the files are bundled. And there's another very, very good advantage which, which is called tree shaking. So imagine that you have uh, 200 files on your application. 200 files is a lot, so probably you may, for, you may refactor some code and forget to just delete one file. Now, if you have the typical bundling that will just get all of the files of the folder and put them together, that file may end up in production. But right now, if nobody is importing that file, the bundler will be smart enough to know, okay, I don't need this file, so I can just throw it out. And so it's less code it's less dead code that will ship into production. So that's really, really cool. So that's it. Those are my favorite parts of ECMAScript 6. There are many more, but I don't want this talk to have like two hours. But the good news is that ECMAScript 2016 is already out. It was released a couple of months ago. So what's next on JavaScript? The answer is not much. So the ECMAScript 2016 actually only has Two main, um, two main features. One of them is called the exponential operator. 
So the exponential operator is basically a simpler way to call math.pound. Now you have this exponential operator, which is, ba which is basically two asterisks. Now the other one is the array.prototype.includes. And this is a very typical scenario where uh, I have an array and I want to see if I have a value inside of that array. What I usually do is compare the index of that content with minus one. Now, I don't have to do that kind of code and I can just be more clear about what I'm doing. I can just say array.includes and I will get a flag saying false or true. Now, a little bit about uh, Equacy 2016. Do you, th so it's really small. It's just these two features. Is this a good sign or a bad sign? I really believe that it's a good sign because as I told you in the beginning, we are now supposed to have yearly iterations on the language. And what this is showing is that they will make a release of the language even if, it's, if, if it is two small features. And think about that. I guess you, you will prefer a lot more to have more, fiction, more, more releases of the language with less changes than, than wait 10 years to have classes and modules in JavaScript because that will, that will make this presentation mm, kind of mm, kind of be mandatory to happen in every company, in every school, in everywhere that, 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 that is learning JavaScript because now you can do things in a very, in a very different way. And by having small iterations, you don't have that difficulty in learning. You'll just have to, now this year, you just have to learn these two more things, so it's pretty easy. And the good news is that ECMAS, the ECMAScript committee is actually very open about itself, so you always know what's coming next. And I will now present you one of my favorite features that is gonna come up next year, which is called the async await functions. So let me take you, let me, give you some seconds to take a look at this code and what it is doing. So if you're not understanding anything that this code is doing, that's normal because I don't, I don't know, I, I don't know either. This is just an example of what in JavaScript is usually known as the callback hell. Because in JavaScript it's very typical to do a synchronous operation and every time that you do an asynchronous operation, you will just throw another callback. And so we, we, you will eventually put callbacks inside, inside of callbacks, inside of callbacks, and an extra tab for each of those callbacks, so eventually you'll end up having more tabs than code. And yeah, that's pretty much unreadable, right? So that's why, uh, that, that's why promises were invented. So a promise basically encapsulates the idea of a future value and lets you work with that. So, Promises were a great way to improve a synchronous code. And I actually, I, I'm actually not talking about promises a lot, and they are included in ECMAScript script 6, but promises have been around for a long, long time. They, they, they were probably the, the, the first framework to include them, uh, the, the first major framework to include them was jQuery, and now if you use, for example, AngularJS, it's all about promises, so many people are now used to work with promises, and now the job of those frameworks is basically to get, the, to get their propri proprietary code out and just let the native code of promises do, do, do the work, but apart from that, you know, they work exactly the same. All implementations are alike. So the thing with, uh, with promises is that, yeah, the code is now much more readable, but I still remember five, about five years ago when I started learning promises, it took me a while to understand them, it took me a while to, be, to feel safe writing them, and even today, if I look at promise-based code, yes, it's a lot better than the mess that we saw before, but still, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel human. It doesn't, if, I, if, I, if I'm trying to think of how I'm gonna do code, I really don't think of promises. And the async await function solves that problem. So basically, when you are declaring an async function and you just need to do that by prepending async to the function declaration, you are now allowed to use the await keyword. And the await keyword is really cool. So basically what this keyword will do is Let's take this, the, the, the first line, I'm doing a fetch over there, and fetch is basically the new, the new XHR 
API that, that is promise based. So I do a fetch, and supposedly, if I want a result, I will then put a JSON and assign that value to a property and then work on it, right? Now, the await keyword does that for me. So basically, if I say I want fetch releases to be the, the, uh, to, to be await fetch and the request, what this actually means is execute that fetch request and when that promise is ready, just get me the value and put it on fetch releases. And this is really cool because th this is really cool because this is the way that humans usually think when they are trying to, to, to in, when they are trying to predict what they are going to write about. I'm getting this, uh, I'm getting this, um, I'm getting this request, then I'm converting it to JSON, then I'm going to do another request based on that one. And the language just is much more human-like and it's completely linear, so you don't get any tabs or, or, or stuff like that. And, uh, and yeah, basically that's it. So the, 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 the great news about this is that it's already available on both Chrome Canary, Canary and Babel, but I'm just putting the link now because in case you try to execute that code, be sure to be using Chrome Canary or else the Babel version that's included on JSBin doesn't re can't really handle a sync, a sync function, so it just won't work. And so, as we come to an end, I want to, pre to present you a slide that I stole from Brandon Ike, the creator of JavaScript. And, and this, what this slide basically says is that, well, first they said that JavaScript couldn't be used for building rich internet applications. And I think we all, well, most of us remember the time where if you wanted to build a big JavaScript application, you either use the Java applet or you'd probably use Flash. And nowadays, nobody likes that time of the year that you have to fill the IRS form and you actually need to execute, to, to install Java in your browser to do so. And then they say that it wouldn't be fast. You know, because it's a scripting language, right? But then V8 came out, then Node.js came out, and nowadays we're actually using it in our server side. So, yeah, it's quite fast. And then they said it couldn't be fixed, you know, because the whole web is built on JavaScript. And so if you change something in the language, you are kind of risking breaking the, breaking the internet. But you see, 20 years have passed since the creation of JavaScript, and here I am presenting a lot of new features of the language, so I guess that's also not true. So my advice to you would be, let's all follow Brandon Ike's advice and keep always betting on JavaScript. Thank you very much. So if you guys have questions, if you guys have questions, you can, you can send them to my Twitter or you can ask them here right now, but if they're complex, maybe I, I'm not be, gonna be able to code right now. But please, throw questions. How are you guys using ECMAScript today? E ECMAScript 6 today? Is everybody using ECMAScript 6 today in a daily basis? Throw your hand up if you're using ECMAScript 6. It's like five people, really? So what's... What, what, what is your problem? So why why are you not? Yeah, yeah, but you don't you use if you use Babel, you can't. Okay, because you need to support IE six and seven and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is a problem. No solu no easy solution for that, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, no questions. But uh, uh, when you were doing the, the async uh, uh, explanation, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you could show it, that would be easier. When you are waiting for the fetch, yeah. with callbacks, you can receive uh, multiple uh, arguments back. Uh, but this only seems that you can only receive uh, one object. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I've act I actually don't have enough experience with a single way to know how I would l deal with that. But, well, with response, with, um, with, for example, API requests, you don't, like, with promises, you usually get yeah, With API get request, just you will just get one string. But uh, usually, uh, JavaScript oh, you mean like, callbacks yeah, like have multiple arguments. Like using this in another, in a promise that would return, 
like an error uh, and a data information, for example. Uh, I don't see how they can translate immediately into a fetch, but maybe there's like documentation on how that uh, can be. Yeah, I think I would see the documentation solved. because I don't have enough experience on a sync await because it's, it's, it's a pretty new thing and I actually don't use it in my production code. It's just okay. for small things so I can't really tell you right now. And actually the, the um, it is in stage four of, ec of the ECMAScript proposals, but it's still prone to have some minor changes. So uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stick to the, to the final API right now because some things may change, but I can't really answer that. Sorry. OK, thank you. Thank you. Oh my god, a security guy. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, just the simple question. The, the import feature from ECMAScript 6. Uh, the file needs to be on the same domain or we can do cross domain for the import. So I can add code to my web application from another source. That is oh, so, okay. So you mean if I, if I try to import something from another domain? Yes. yes. I, have, I have no idea about that, but I would believe that the cross domain applications, the, the cross domain restrictions would apply to, but I'm not really sure. I don't think I don't think you, yeah, probably you can do it, but the, you will be subject to course. But I'm, I have no idea about that. I'm just trying to guess. Okay. Any more questions? Nothing, nothing else? All right, so start using ECMAScript 6. Just, uh, just make sure that you don't have to support IE6 and stuff like that, because yeah, or else it, it will be impossible. Thank you.